All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on recent advances in autonomous environmental monitoring technologies to support offshore wind energy development. My name is Haley Farr, and I'm a scientist at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, and I'll be facilitating today's webinar with my colleague Jeffrey Clerk from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. On today's agenda, we will begin with a brief overview of the SEER effort before diving into our speaker presentations. After that, we'll do some panel discussion, audience Q&A, and then a few closing remarks. All right, so for a bit of background, SEER is a jointly led effort between the Pacific Northwest National Lab and National Renewable Energy Lab to lead information sharing for the environmental effects of offshore wind energy and help prioritize future research needs. The overall goals of SEER are to synthesize existing information on environmental effects, uh, monitoring tools, and mitigation to help identify remaining gaps and to collaborate with the regional experts and science entities to fully leverage um, community expertise. So far, the SEER team has published a series of educational research briefs on seven uh, stressor receptor interactions or topic areas. We've also has hosted a public webinar series um, to dive further into the topics of those research briefs and those again featured experts as well. And then finally, we pu published research recommendations for both the US Atlantic and Pacific coasts to help inform and guide development in those regions. Um, all of these resources, resources are available on TFIS as will the recording for today's webinar. All right, so diving right into the speaker presentations, our first speaker will be Brian Zelenke, the Surface Current Programs Manager for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Integrated Ocean Observing System. We'll then have Van Sophie Van Paris, the Passive Acoustic Program Lead from NOAA Fisheries. And finally, John Ryan, who is a Biological Oceanographer from Monterey Bay Aquarium's Research Institute. So with that, uh, Brian, go ahead and take it away. Thank you. And good morning all, or for those uh, like myself who are on the East Coast, good afternoon. Uh, hopefully everyone should now be seeing the introductory slide in my deck. Is that about right? Looks great. Excellent, thank you. Well, I'm here to talk to you today about the Integrated Ocean Observing System and uh, Autonomous Environmental Monitoring Applications to Offshore Wind Energy Development. Um, as it applies to the IUS network that we have and, and the program. Um, if you have any questions about this webinar, please do feel free. Uh, or any questions about this presentation, please do feel free to contact me. And also, I understand that the organizers will be posting a copy of this presentation. Um, so in case anybody's furiously taking notes, feel assured that you'll be able to get this information um, later. So I'm, I'd like to divide uh, my presentation today into three separate sections that you see bullet pointed here. Um, and I'll first start off talking about kind of doing this maybe a little bit backwards, talking about offshore wind, which I'm assuming most of you are already familiar with, and some of the lessons that we've learned, and then circle back specifically to IUS and talk more about those applications. And here you see in the upper right hand figure there, a little bit of a preview, there's a high frequency radar station. And offshore, you can see the Black Island wind farm, some of its turbines. So uh, an example already of where our autonomous observing technologies are overlapping with offshore wind and that's certain to increase in the future. So speaking about increasing in the future, um, some circles it's, uh, have considered offshore wind to be a, an, an Atlantic problem for now or uh, solutions uh, need to be focused uh, specifically in the, the Northeast. And while certainly that's uh, an area where offshore wind is at the forefront, it really is truly a nationwide issue, as you can see with these figures. So we will all have to um, be focused on that, regardless of whether in the Pacific, Gulf, uh, Atlantic, or, or other areas of the nation. And further, uh, it's worthwhile taking a moment to appreciate the scale of the issue at hand. Um, I draw your attention to that figure, uh, and rather the bullet points on the left, where, what does it mean to have 30 gigawatts of offshore wind for the administration's goal? Um, the Department of Energy study estimated that it would take 2,100 turbines to achieve that goal. Now, turbines go up pretty fast. They can be erected in less than a week. So perhaps this comparison isn't 
entirely apt insofar as skyscrapers are much more complex structures, but nonetheless, the height scale is about right. Um, the turbines using the Block Island wind farm, they're about 600 feet tall, and newer wind turbine designs are, are only getting taller, not shorter, in the offshore realm. So uh, in the entirety of the United States, there's 853 skyscrapers at the last count I was able to get a hold of. So what you're talking about here in terms of offshore wind is not the equivalent of you know, building Manhattan in the offshore. It's building many Manhattans worth of skyscrapers across the offshore and Chicago and Houston and so on and so forth um, all throughout the country. So this really is a transformational change in the ocean environment and needs to be taken into account across a number of different dimensions, um, fortunately many of which we have tools to observe. So another uh, perspective in terms of offshore wind worth reminding ourselves of is that the mere presence of the turbines does indeed change the environment in which they're in. Um, specifically, the turbine monopilings, they do change current and, and wind flow fields. There's considerable downstream effects. Here we have uh, an example, not specifically of a wind turbine, but just showing the, what the deformation in a flow field looks like from one particular object in the way wind farms are uh, set to consist of, in some cases, I've been scoped at over 100 turbines. So you're really talking about um, changing the dy dynamics and the physics in the area, and that has follow-on effects for a number of different models and forecasts uh, that NOAA does for weather, but also the applications of those sorts of forecasts, like for search and rescue applications. Um, changes are in, that are induced by changes in flow field include upwelling and downwelling effects, which modify ocean temperature, which modify search and rescue recovery times. And this is only one example. Um, all of those effects also have uh, follow-on impacts to ocean and marine life, which I understand other of the presenters will be going to an even greater depth. And further, um, offshore wind impacts are not restricted to the physical environment itself, but also it impacts those tools that we use to monitor it. So as a surface currents program manager, um, that makes me the lead for the nation's oceanographic high frequency radar network that uses a, a series of about 160 stations on land across the coast of the US to monitor the better part of our uh, exclusive economic zone, the, the uh, continental shelf in near real time measuring surface current velocity and wave information. Um, and like many radar systems, offshore wind turbines confuse the signal of radars in such a way that um, it's difficult to recover that signal in some cases uh, there's not been innovations yet to how to recover that signal um, from the interference induced by the turbines. So courtesy of the folks at uh, the Mid-Atlantic Regional Association of IUS, uh, pronounce that acronym MARACUS, as you can see it written up there, have a simulate, we have a real data on the left, uh, a band of coverage in that Mid-Atlantic region as an example. And this is representative, uh, other areas of the country have similarly dense coverage. Um, that's actual data there that you see on the left, and that's what we're getting now, kind of an hourly basis um, current velocity. And then if you look at the right, you'll see the simulated impacts of what if there were wind farms in those little black boxes that you see. Um, and as you can see from the electromagnetic simulation on the right, the impact, the amount of data that would be taken away from that disturbance extends well beyond the wind farm regions for this particular sensor type. Um, so not only do offshore wind farms make us concerned about uh, impacts to the environment and better understanding it, but it also makes us uh, need to sharpen some of the tools in our toolbox to ameliorate those and mitigate those uh, impacts. Fortunately, uh, for our HF radar, we have a number of mitigation programs funded by Department of Energy, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, and our, our own NOAA uh, underway that have uh, shown considerable promise and also partnership with offshore wind developers. But nonetheless, um, that sort of proactive and collaborative approach needs to be taken um, for a whole host of observation types. So the lessons that I think you can learn from appreciating the impact on the ocean environment and our ability to observe it and how it relates to offshore wind and assistance its need, needs are summarized a bit here um, by these bullet points. 
wordy, I'll admit, but I draw your attention in particular to the two um, examples there. Um, and some of the folks at NIRA, who's our uh, Northeast Regional Association of IUs, have uh, done some great work in particular developing these scenarios. Um, as an example, it impacts on fisheries, impacts on marine mammals, and the challenge if you don't have the right information on potentially misattributing those impacts or unfairly allocating them to offshore wind versus other types of environmental change and stressors. And it's only with the right kind of ocean data, the right kind of measurement um, that we can disentangle those and really understand what impacts and what mitigations are appropriate with respect to offshore wind and then what other challenges we have. So with that, fortunately, we have a lot of tools in our toolbox and I'd like to talk about those and the autonomous environmental monitoring that we do as part of your integrated ocean observing system. So this figure as an uh, image here is a, a lovely summary. I, I wish it was, uh, you know, us able to measure quite this densely across the world's oceans. And you'll even see if you look toward the upper right offshore wind turbines. And you'll also note that not all of these uh, sensors that are representative for, uh, of autonomous measurements, but quite a few are. And this really sums up nicely, in my view, what I use is a cooperative, cooperative network of both federal and non-federal partners that have been working together now, as you can see, for quite some time, since 2009. Um, we've aggregated truly thousands of separate data sets with millions and millions of data points in many of them, and all of those are publicly accessible. And historically, of course, we've supported weather forecasting, maritime safety, and then ocean and public health, uh, making sure that we're protecting both life and property. But uh, increasingly, offshore wind development is an application of this information and um, hope to delve into that a bit more in the next few slides. But first to talk slightly about the structure of IUS. How do we do all this? Um, the IUS office within NOAA that I work in is a much smaller footprint of a much larger enterprise. We are comprised of 11 regional associations that are consortia of academic and state, local, tribal government, private industry. And they're shown in the figure on the left. We uh, often like to, since most of their uh, acronyms end in OOS, we like to uh, refer them to the OOSs sometimes. Um, but you can see the 11 mapped out there and the areas of concern that they have and how that covers um, the United States waters. But even those 11 regional associations um, together are not the entirety of IUS. We also have our federal partners. And while NOAA is the lead for IUS, uh, the logos that you see there of all the other agencies are additional components and collaborators and contributors to the IUS enterprise. And US IUS, that's the United States contribution to the um, global ocean observing system, the GOOS. So you really have. Um, through this enterprise, whether you're here in the United States, whether you're elsewhere in the world, and whether your concerns are regional or national or what scale, and an opportunity to get data and to work with partners um, to understand offshore wind development impacts on a whole host of scales. So with that, a good, que a good question is, what do we actually measure? And IUS has, in its area of focus, 34 core variables spanning the disciplines of biology and ecosystems, biogeochemistry, and as a physical oceanographer by training, near and dear to my heart, physics. Um, all of these data sets are available in various locations for various time periods, um, but all of them are available to you uh, through the IUS program and without cost. So what do we use to measure um, all of those different types of variables? We have a host of sensors and uh, highlighting here a number of our autonomous and environmental monitoring assets. Perhaps the SEALs would disagree about exactly how autonomous some of this is, but nonetheless, um, all of these sensors contribute to those data sets that you see. And we have program managers in the IUS office um, that specifically focus 
on these individual types of measurements and work with our regional association and other partners to deliver you those data. As for where you can get those data, IUS.us, that website is our portal of portals, which you can use to either go to the regional associations and their data assembly centers or specific sensor maps, uh, looking at forecast models, just a whole host of different ways to get at that core information uh, and those variables throughout the data sets that I presented earlier. So I'd like to finish by talking about the applications to offshore wind of all that information and in light of those lessons that we've learned from the scope of development. Um, here you can see on the right kind of our, our conceptualization of IUS, what we believe it to be relevant to in that outer ring and uh, definitely offshore wind needs to be in addition to that. And on the next inner ring, you see the logo of the agencies and regional association partners that are contributing to IUS, all of which advance in those further concentric rings to your, your one IUS, um, to that in observing enterprise that comprises all of those different aspects. And fortunately here in the United States, we have some of the most uh, developed and advanced ocean observing systems that we can bring to bear to achieve those very um, ambitious goals of 30 gigawatts by 2030 and even more ambitious goals in the future. Um, to achieve those goals though, it will take robust data, it will take these analytical systems because they're essential to developing offshore wind. Um, its impacts to the environment, its impacts to our observing capabilities, that's uh, a consideration that we have as oceanographers, but also those impacts in turn in influence the way in which offshore wind is developed, where it can be permitted, the structures themselves, their engineering, and all of that takes information and data so fortunately, IUS as a uh, enterprise has the ability to serve in that convening function to be a touch point for all the regulators and interested people um, in the development of offshore wind to not only get data, but also to contribute data and to help understand how to use those data. So I'm looking forward very much to working with colleagues and talking with you a bit more about how we can use those uh, data for specific applications. And with that, um, I don't know if there's questions now, but I will uh, open the floor. So we'll go ahead and take questions at the end, but feel free to add them to the chat now or throughout the next few presentations. Thank you. Next up, we have Sophie. Great, let me see if I can get this up. Sophie, it muted you again. Just as she's getting that worked out, I put a few links in the chat to our SEER page on TFIS. Uh, the webinar recording and slides will be available on the event page, which I also put the link to. And then at the end, we'll touch on our next SEER webinar as well, which will be next week on Wednesday, I believe. Um, Sophie, you still look muted to me. I am what? trying not to mute me when I share my screen. <laughs> no worries. That's right. Yeah, that there you go. Okay, wonderful. Sorry. No idea why Zoom was doing that to me. Um, okay, great. Thank you. And um, I'm thrilled to be able to talk. That was super interesting, Brian. I had a lot learned there actually about how use. Um, so I'm going to just uh, present about passive acoustic technologies and research that we've been doing in the Atlantic Ocean um, with a lot of relevance to um, some of the wind efforts and development that's um, happening there at the moment. So just to give you a background as to why um, we're using passive acoustic monitoring largely for a lot of these questions is we're focused um, on underwater sounds, but also basically um, light is absorbed within 200 meters of the ocean surface. So a lot of the ocean is dark and for the marine animals um, in the ocean, their primary modality is not 
visual like it is for us um, terrestrial animals. It is actually sound that they use in order to communicate. Um, sound travels five times faster in water than it does in air, and therefore it's a really great way in order to get your message across to find each other and to basically perform all the life functions that are needed. In terms of my research um, group, we're an applied ecology research program um, that focuses on passive acoustics. We are interested in every single thing that we can autonomously record um, in the ocean. So we're interested in what marine mammal sounds are making, fish sounds, crustaceans. We're interested in weather events like earthquakes or weather. We're interested also in understanding um, the effects of ship noise, um, seismic surveys, fish finders, as well as obviously um, wind farm development um, impacts. So why use passive acoustic monitoring? It really provides this um, non-invasive and a valuable alternative, as well as an addition to traditional survey methods, such as visual surveys, um, which are largely used for studying um, marine mammals. Um, the benefits really are that you can detect animals at night um, as well as in bad weather. So basically any time, it doesn't matter what the weather's like out there. And it also allows for this really great record of long-term monitoring. Um, at reduced field effort, you don't need as many bodies out on the water and obviously um, they can be out for longer when you um, use acoustic units. And um, we can also, if you have enough of them, for example, like the um, autonomous units that Brian was showing as you can cover wider spatial ranges and cover large areas and swaths of the ocean. Obviously, like any technology, um, there are limitations. Um, with passive acoustic monitoring, we can really only um, give you information on presence. Um, if the animals are not making sounds, we can't tell you whether they're there or not. So they have to be vocally active or acoustically active. Um, for most species as well, we still are at the point where we tend to look at distributional changes rather than the actual number of individuals. For some species, you can get to numbers, but for many, that's still um, research that needs to be done to see um, and develop um, that technology or application. Um, many sounds um, that we listen to are still unknown. We're constantly finding sounds that we actually cannot attribute even sometimes to whether it's a biological sound or an anthropogenic sound. So there's a lot of sounds out there in the ocean that still are just mysteries to us as well. What are the different um, autonomous technologies that we use? This is just um, an infographic of the technologies that um, we primarily have used um, for the our work in the Atlantic Ocean. We have two different types of data collection. Um, which we divide into archival and real-time data collection. Archival simply means that you need to wait until you get your acoustic um, sensor back on shore before you can get the data and access the data, as opposed to real-time, which provides you with information in the data while it's actually out at sea. Now, when it comes to archival recorders, this is the um, orange circles that you can see in the infographic. Those tend to be things like bottom mounted acoustic recorders. And there's a couple of um, examples there, as well as acoustic tags that you can place on animals. Um, for real time, it can be a variety of different things. Often it's moored buoys with this kind of surface expression so they can send back satellite information. You can have gliders that provide information when they come to the surface, um, towed arrays that get towed behind research vessels or other ships, drop hydrophones as well as drifting buoys. These are all different types of technologies that we use. Um, we also include telemetry tags, which is that little blue surface uh, circle, sorry. Um, that's not actually a passive acoustics, it's an active acoustic um, transmission because the tag that's put on the fish provides um, a ping at a certain frequency, but it's something that we often integrate into the data collection that we um, have ongoing. So what can our passive acoustics monitoring um, approaches tell us? Largely, we look at three different major components in terms of answers that are provided. We look at at passive acoustics monitoring in terms of collecting information of distribution of animals over large spatial areas, such as that um, image on the left, long time periods, so multiple years. It's a great way of building long time series, as well as on the right, um, this is shows um, a 
figure of different species and the frequencies over which they actually produce their sounds. The higher frequency species are up the top, lower frequencies are down the bottom, and you have months um, on the x-axis. So this way is a way to look at the different frequency ranges that each species uses and how they over overlap with each other or not. Um, in addition, you can also then place, in this case, the darker colors like the grays are anthropogenic sources, such as vessels or air guns. And you can look at um, when and what frequency ranges over which these anthropogenic noise sources might impact um, different species when they're vocalizing and affect their ability to communicate with each other, potentially. So, Here's a quick look at some of the archival passive acoustic um, data that we collect. Um, for the Atlantic Ocean, this is where we, as just in my research group, have had passive acoustic instruments. So you can see it goes from all the way up in Canada, all the way down to the Caribbean um, and into the Gulf of Mexico. So we have had a lot of recorders out there collecting information over the last two decades. Um, one of the big things that we are really interested in is whether we can see long-term changes um, in distribution of endangered species, in particular these baleen whales that we have, these five different species on um, in the Atlantic coast, so on the east coast of the U.S. This um, data is currently, we're actually, as you can see, went from 2004 to 2014, we currently are redoing this analysis to add on the next decade of information. Um, and this was a large collaborative effort between a multitude of different scientists who had different recording devices and provided their data to be able to look at the distribution of these whale species from the sounds they made. So this is just an example of the um, right whale, the North Atlantic right whale, critically endangered species, and the acoustic hotspots will show you how they move up and down the coast um, on their migratory routes. Um, you can see their um, movements changing by month, and this is just the results from the passive acoustic um, data that we extracted from all of those recorders over that decade. You can see they're up north in the summertime and you'll slowly see them moving down south again um, over their um, fall and then into the winter. And as you can see in December, they're kind of pretty much distributed up and down the entire coastline. So these are kind of things that you can do looking at passive acoustic information. This is another way of looking at data. We spend a lot of time trying to visualize our information in the most accessible way possible so that managers or other or industry can also access this and be able to make informed decisions when they um, conduct their work. So here, for example, this is the different regions we had. We started up um, in around Greenland where our recorders were, and then it travels all the way down the East Coast, down to the Caribbean, down to number 11. And this is rather than just showing right wells, it shows all five species. Um, and when there were acoustically present over that decade, you've got months down the bottom. And so you can look at what time periods and in what regions these species were present. If you actually look to the left of the figure and slowly let your eyes move up and then back down again, you'll see that many of these species migrate because you see them down in the south predominantly in the winter time, January kind of through to March, you see them migrate up in the summertime up north and then back down again. So you can get a lot of information out of these kind of um, data products. The other thing that we're really interested in doing and which we'll look at again now with this next decade is whether you could use acoustics to see changes in distribution. And this is again, just a quick look at um, North Atlantic right whales. And um, we knew already um, in 2010 that the oceans in the Atlantic have changed considerably and right whales we'd already had seen from visual surveys that they'd moved away from some of the Northern areas. And we were interested in seeing whether the passive acoustic data that we had on hand could actually show these similar shifts. And if you look at that, you can see that pre-2010 on the left, there was a lot of acoustic activity that's in those yellow bar plots. And then if you go to the right, you, you can see that it significantly decreased showing that movement away from that area by right whales. Um, we also saw that in the mid-Atlantic, this Nantucket, New York area and New Jersey, Virginia area. On the left, there was very few acoustic activity and on the right, there was a lot more. So we saw an increase in the mid-Atlantic. So you can use this type of information to look at changes over these broad scales and over kind of the spatial scales that these animals actually live across. 
So one of the um, tools we have built since then is our passive acoustic citation map. If you actually just type in um, NOAA or NEFSC passive acoustic citation map, you should get the link to it because it's not a great one to remember off by heart. And this allows you to explore the historical data, not just from our um, NOAA collection, but from many other um, scientists and researchers as well. It allows you to look at data from bottom mounted recorders, gliders, surface buoys, and for multiple species, we have beaked whales in there. We have a number um, range of um, species um, that you can explore and you should definitely try it out. It's a great way to kind of explore information and understand when animals are acoustically present. So just um, quickly to give you a bit of a look at wind energy development. Brian showed you the slide of the East Coast development and where um, we have particularly focused with our passive acoustic um, tools has initially been this Massachusetts, Rhode Island wind energy lease block areas. And this is just primarily because this is one of the first area that is now currently um, being, is under construction. Um, we had a number of recorders out over several years prior to this construction, over the two years prior to it. And um, we were interested in getting some baseline information so that we can start to look at any changes in distribution or other that we might find um, in this region. The first thing we were most interested in is just simply is this an important area for um, marine mammals or not? Um, and so if you look at our acoustic um, data here, this is two years of data. Again, you've seen this before kind of thing down the bottom are the months of the year. This two years amalgamated. And on the right, you've got the different species and the call types um, is what we use to um, add the information as to when they were present or not. So what you can see here is we have eight species, one family of cetaceans at the dolphins, because we can't split them easily to um, species type. And what you can see here is that they really have different um, times of the year that they're predominantly using this area. Many are in there in the winter time, then some are not there in the summer, again, then in the fall. Um, they'll be coming back. So you can see there's a variety of different trends. For example, sperm whales, which are the third ones down, they seem to be there primarily in the springtime and in the summertime. Um, if you go to right whales, which is that yellow um, line, you can see they're mostly there um, in the wintertime, the spring, they leave largely, though are slightly present still throughout the summer. And then again, in October, they um, return to this area. So it gives you a lot of information as to how these animals use this area and how particularly the endangered species we have to be concerned with um, um, use this area. We're also interested in looking at more than just marine mammals. We're interested in being able to understand how the ambient noise um, might change. So whether the sound field that's out there changes when we have um, wind energy construction and whether any of these turbines might increase just the background ambient sounds um, over the long term because like Brian was saying this is like multiple Manhattans so if we put in multiple Manhattans in the ocean does that actually make the ocean more noisy even once we've gotten through the construction period and so this is just some of the baseline information the yellow is noisier the blue is quieter and so we'll be able to use this data to look at what's coming next. We also use passive acoustics to help um, advise managers in terms of how they can use this tool for mitigation. So when um, construction is actually happening, how to actually um, help influence that. We do things like we look at persistence, for example, how long do um, right whales persist in this Massachusetts, Rhode Island area? In this case, it's around, the average will be around 10 days. So when they're there and they're calling, they'll hang out for an average of around 10 days. Um, on the right hand side, you can see we've actually looked at how long you need to listen for before you should start prowl driving to have different levels of certainty whether a right whale is in the area or not. And so, for example, if you look at the bottom left hand corner, the 3.91%, that is if you listen for an hour. So you have basically 4% chance of um, detecting a right whale in the area if you approach it this way. Obviously, if you go up to the 74%, you've, um, you need to be monitoring for 18 hours if you want to have a 74% certainty that you are likely to hear a right whale. So these are the kind of different tools that we um, advance. Um, 
This is the passive acoustic regional framework that we work together with in BOEM um, at the moment to try and collect data across all wind lease areas. So this is what we're trying to aim to do. I doubt we'll get to quite this um, level of um, acoustic recording, but we're trying to um, get as much as possible in some of these core areas. And then lastly, real-time monitoring and mitigation is huge um, and is a significant contributor for us as well. We primarily use slocum gliders and moored buoys to do this. Um, and what can we do with this? So this real-time, um, these real-time moorings and gliders on the right here is a, a glider track and it shows you when and where different species of whales were detected. Right whales are in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, so Primarily before wind energy came along, we were usually mainly use this to direct our research boats to where right whales might be or our aerial surveys. Um, but now more and more we're using this to reduce ship strike risk. Um, we've created um, these slow zones that are triggered by acoustic presence. And obviously this is also now becoming widely used this technology um, during wind farm operations. There's different ways in which to get that information. There's a number of different websites and platforms, the real time. Um, so alerts can get set out by email or by text. And there's also the whale alert app. So that's kind of the different technologies that are used to provide that real time information at the moment. And here's just an example of those slow zones I was talking about, both visual surveys when they see a right whale or an if we hear a right whale acoustically, these slow zones get put into place and mariners get notified that right whales are in the area and ask to slow down. And this is just a quick look at our website. If you're interested in learning more, please go there. And um, that's what I've got for you today. Thank you, Sophie. All right, next up we have John. Hey, thanks. Um, branching from Sophie's focus on passive acoustic monitoring, I'm going to examine some case studies from uh, the West Coast in which we are integrating passive acoustic monitoring with other technologies, ultimately to understand where and how animals live. We are focused on whales, and as Sophie showed, they can contribute a lot of signal that helps us understand their presence um, and behavior. So for example, this is thir a 34 minute spectrogram of sound covering um, up to nearly 10 kilohertz showing simultaneous song from three species of whales. And um, the first case study is a good entry point. It's a focus on an endangered species, blue whales. And um, in this study, we, were, we set out to study the behavioral ecology of blue whales as related to foraging ecology. And we were surprised to learn um, about their risk exposure. <clears throat> and I wanna begin by thanking all my uh, collaborators in this study from six institutions. And that's really, really the only way we could do this research by bringing together effective technologies. And so, um, the, th the technology I'm gonna start with is called an acoustic vector sensor. It is a hydrophone, an underwater microphone that measures pressure, which can tell us um, the nature of the sound. And we can identify the species associated with that sound. In addition, this acoustic vector sensor um, measures three-dimensional, <clears throat> excuse me, water velocity, which allows us to go beyond, that was a blue whale to the blue whale is over there. We get, we get a bearing, a direction uh, of origin of that sound source. So what you're looking at here on this map is Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary along the central coast of California. This cable and this uh, dot here is the Monterey Accelerated Research System Cable Observatory. And on this cable observatory, we had an acoustic vector sensor owned and operated by the Naval Postgraduate School. Uh, simultaneously, Jeremy Goldbogen's lab at Stanford uh, had tags out on whales. And these tags can tell us about animal behavior as, as well as location from GPS. So this white dot here is the GPS location of a whale that was singing. And um, we matched that song up when it was received 20 seconds later at the observatory, uh, matched the cadence of that song and 
uh, asked the question, does the acoustic vector sensor point to the whale? <laughs> the short story is, yes, it does. It worked very well, and it gave us confidence to use two years of observations, two years of song seasons from blue whales, to evaluate how blue whales move through the environment, at least move around the compass with regard to Mars. And in this map on the right, what you're looking at is sea surface temperature. Uh, we had predicted that blue whales would respond to these cold plumes. Uh, cooler temperatures here are in blues and greens. Um, this is a upwelling plume driven by uh, alongshore equatorward winds that bring cold water to the surface. Point Año Nuevo is one such location where that water comes to the surface, and then it flows in a filament, typically partially into Monterey Bay and partially offshore. We had predicted that blue whales would follow these because we had learned a few years ago that within these upwelling plumes, krill, which is all that blue whales eat, um, form dense aggregations in these plumes. So let's just look at how, how blue whales respond. Um, another key element though here is modeling of acoustic transmission. We needed to know how far away can the whale be and we can still hear it with sufficient strength that we can accurately point to the, the direction that that whale is. And this, this work was done by the Naval Postgraduate School, this modeling. So now let's, let's watch whales move through the environment using this passive acoustic monitoring technology. Um, this is that same map on the right. Here's one of those upwelling plumes. And these plumes come and go, go with the changes in the wind. And what we're going to look at is the percentage of calling of, of blue by blue whales coming from two directional sectors. One of them is between these two bearings, which we might say is in the bay. And the other is offshore between these two red bearings in habitat that is transected by four shipping lanes. And what you can see in this time series of a couple of months is these percentages oscillating inversely. So uh, during the early part of this time series, um, blue whales were um, largely offshore in this, in this directional sector. Then during this period, they seemed to move into the bay. Much of the calling was coming from within the bay. And then they left the bay and came back. So what was happening underneath this movement of the blue whales is oceanography and specifically wind-driven upwelling. So this location here is, is the location of a mooring that is in the path of upwelling flow. And when, when we see cold, dense water arriving at this mooring, we know that upwelling is active and it's flowing into the bay. So here we see these density contours, the density of the water. When these come to the surface, that cold, dense water is right at the mouth of the bay. And of course, the blue whales um, were tracking that upwelling plume right into the bay. And if we back up to the cause of that upwelling, it is the winds. This is the upwelling index showing a strong single pulse upwelling into the bay and whales following. Then upwelling relaxed, the whales left the bay, went offshore into habitat transected by shipping lanes, and then upwelling spun up again, bringing that dense water into the bay along with the whales. So that's the, what, you know, bearing, just bearing to the sound source can get us. And the wind energy area in our region, of course, is the Morro Bay wind energy area. And we began baseline uh, monitoring at two locations near this wind energy area. The first is immediately inshore toward the coast. And the second is near Morro Bay. This we thought was important blue whale habitat. And uh, this we thought was important sea otter habitat. And so here are those locations. Um, it really is a, a regional nexus. We have Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, the proposed Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary, uh, both adjacent to this wind energy development area. And uh, this CHO1 site uh, it was indeed, <laughs> has proven to be, um, important sea otter habitat. There were eight otters around the mooring when Lindsay last was out there and turned around our, the, the mooring that is recording. And then uh, this MBO5 in Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary is, is also, it's right at the head of this canyon, La Cruz Canyon. Uh, it's a sanctuary ecologically sensitive area, number 15. And 
Indeed, that has proven to be important, blue whale habitat. So what you're looking at in this spectrogram of a day in the life of this soundscape is a number of signals. Um, here's fish during the uh, night and coursing at uh, uh, dusk and dawn. But the strongest and most persistent signal here is the third harmonic of the blue whale B call, which is what we use to track uh, the blue whales in that previous study. And you can see the, the maximum, the strongest signals heard that day were from blue whales. So <clears throat> this wasn't just any day, August 13th. It was the arrival day of a whale that was tagged much further north in the Gulf of the Farallones. And these data are thanks to James Fallbush, John Callum Bikidis at Cascadia, and uh, Will Astrike, who's working uh, to uh, understand these data in a number of ways, as I'll, I'll illustrate. But here's La Cruz Canyon. Here's that uh, recording site. And we can see the, every dot is a, is a position for the animal. And they're colored by time. So from green to yellow to orange and into red, that tells you how the animal moved through time. And if we zoom out a little bit, this location at La Cruz Canyon is right here where the animal began to linger. And um, it very quickly really moved down the coast to this location. And this is where um, the tag data becomes really critical because uh, it gives us a window into, into their behavior. Specifically in this 10 day track, here's the vertical profile of that whale doing repeated dives, of course, along the way, breathing at the surface, a number of uh, behaviors. I'm just gonna focus on the feeding lunges, which is, you know, the, this is very rich habitat for them to forage. And what we can see is the, the whale moved very quickly down to La Cruz Canyon. And that's when all the foraging activity began from quite shallow to quite deep and, and very active throughout this period. So it is clearly um, essential blue whale habitat. Um, now, what, the second technology I want to highlight here is um, listening with light, distributed acoustic sensing. And the first study using this technology was led by Lea Buffo, who is a postdoc at Cornell. And working in the Arctic, she and colleagues uh, demonstrated how the strain measured by optical fibers and seafloor cables can measure sound and perhaps even localize, not just along the cable, but on a map, where is the animal? So <clears throat> this is um, the first study and we're working with Leia as well as um, Li Wei Chen and Richard Allen at Berkeley uh, Seismology Laboratory. <clears throat> and um, Li Wei and Richard are using the Mars cable, the same one I just showed you the study from, um, and this distributed acoustic sensing. So here's a, phenomenally clear blue whale bee call measured using light, <laughs> you know, strain on an optical fiber. And similarly, here's really a clear detection of fin whale pulses. So two endangered species being um, detected by light in an optical fiber. Um, there are existing submarine cables landing at and near Morro Bay. Um, there's the Japan-US cable network and Southern Cross cable network that actually land right here in Morro Bay. Also, there's the Pacific Crossing one that uh, extends through this region where the wind energy development, near where the wind energy development is going to occur, uh, landing at Grover Beach. And lastly, um, as Sophie illustrated, there are a number of platforms we can use to target um, passive acoustic monitoring. And the glider example Sophie showed is one great example. And there are other autonomous vehicles that can um, uh, glide and propel to move back to lo targeted locations of interest. This is the long range AUV that, that we're working with. There are floats, for example, this one from SeaTrek, um, which can uh, stay deep in the water so that they uh, can listen well in a quiet environment and not get advected too far away from where you want them to be. And, and yet you can use model systems to steer the floats use, with knowledge of what the ocean currents are doing, where the float is. And of course, what we're about to deploy this weekend in the Morro Bay region, when we turn around the moorings, a, a classic simple mooring with um, a float, a line with the hydrophone, temperature sensor, 
acoustic release and uh, anchor. Um, so in summary, the prevalence of acoustic behavior in marine species and the powerful transmission of sound through the ocean do make passive acoustic monitoring essential and effective. And beyond detection of animal presence, we need to know where and how they live and how that intersects with our activities in order to inform management. There are tremendous opportunities for technology development and application. Um, when we integrate population level observation, which passive acoustic monitoring gives us and individual level observations um, within the context of ecosystem dynamics. And that the tag data are essential not only for understanding the behavior of the animals, but for ground truthing our remote sensing technologies, the passive acoustic monitoring. And naturally the Morro Bay region is a rich nexus between uh, wind energy development and technology application for protected species and habitats. All right, thank you so much, John, that's fascinating. Um, just a quick reminder, please place your questions in the chat for the speakers. I'll get things started though. Um, so if all our speakers wanna turn your cameras on, please. Um, for our first for group question, for your area of expertise and your technology, I guess, of focus, what are the remaining challenges surrounding development, deployment, and application of that technology? Whoever would like to go first. Uh, I'll take a crack at it. I think um, that's, that's a big one, and I'm going to focus on just one part of it from at least my perspective and I use, and that's optimizing these observing networks and observing sensor configurations to measure not just you know, individual developments, but really wind energy areas. Um, and I think that's, that's going to be um, get, getting developers and coordinating them to work together is going to be a challenge. And then further the ingest of those data. What are the entities that are going to take these potentially scads of various sensors from different manufacturers in different regions, different developers, and ingest them into a framework that makes them available for the use of not just the individual developer, but really our community. So I'm, I definitely, obviously I'm biased. I see IUS as having a very significant role in that convening function and a, a challenge ahead. But um, I think that's also a representative of the need of the offshore wind community and, and its regulators um, to make sure that we're getting the measurements in the right places um, to be able to address the challenges that we've discussed here today. Hey, I'm, I'm Sophie, would you like to go first or? Um, I don't mind. I was just going to uh, agree with Brian and say we're actually working towards a lot of those um, with passive acoustic monitoring. Um, but yes, I mean, they still remain hugely <laughs> challenging. <laughs> but um, I think we've made strides, but um, yeah, we're still a ways off. Yeah, I, I'll, I would go back to that case study where we we were able to observe with a single acoustic vector sensor at one, one region where we can see how they respond to a single upwelling center, um, how they move in response to the wind and wind-driven circulation. And I think that a key challenge, um, I think validation is one and uh, animal telemetry was key to, to validating that single sensor. But if we can use multiple acoustic vector sensors with independent bearings to an animal, we can, we can estimate range. We can put the animal on the map, which I think is, is uh, both important and, and challenging. But we are in the process of, of testing that now with the Naval Postgraduate School uh, having deployed a, a dual acoustic vector sensor system. So data are streaming from that now and we'll, we'll be testing that. Um, and with distributed acoustic sensing, I think there are some really fundamental questions about how far away from the cable um, the animal can be and for us to be able to detect it. And that has not been characterized yet. So again, here, um, animal tags in the region of these cables where we can match up signals at the source on the animal with uh, the signal received on the, the DAS system. Um, so yeah, those are some of the key ones. 
Thank you. Yeah, and actually speaking to that a bit, we have a, an audience question here. Location data is clearly valuable. What density of real-time PAM buoys would need to be would be needed to triangulate the exact location of each right whale call? So this is for Sophie or John. I guess. Yeah, I just actually put that back. In. I just <laughs> sent a message back in, through the chat. Yeah, I was just saying that's actually something that that's more and more people are looking at because we need it for the um, looking at um, ship strike reduction in the wind lease areas. And, you know, the answer is at least three, um, but more often is needed depending on how far away they can hear. Um, and also just, you know, many sensors now have bearing um, as well, which at least gives you a direction in which the animals are at. So I think this is in terms of, um, yeah, instrument development and, and improvement. This is definitely part um, of something people are working on. Great. Uh, our next question, any organizations working on AI acoustic data classification? So artificial intelligence, are any of you familiar with those areas? <laughs> I can jump in here and say yes. I'll, I'll drop a link into the chat um, of that example of well, machine learning versus AI. We can get to a, a debate that probably goes well beyond this talk as to the, the differences. But um, suffice to say, that's that's but one example um, within IUS and its collaborators that are working on that area. Yeah, I I just. Um, I'm wrapping up a paper with a similar, similarly large group of co-authors, and the paper started because NOAA and Google published uh, a convolutional neural network that was very good at detecting humpback whale song, and it worked very well for our data, even though it was developed for, from recordings around Hawaii, and uh, allowed us to see striking long-term trends in the detection of humpback whale song and relate that to changes in other species of whales. So yeah, it's a tremendous tool. It works, in this case, the AI works better than I do and a lot faster. Sophie, would you like to add anything there? Um, no, I mean, definitely um, AI is a, a big help at the moment in terms of trying to get through a lot of our data. I know we use an AI built humpback whale detector and um, you know, as John knows too, his usage as well. Um, so yeah, I think it's uh, definitely a way forward for the field. Well, thank you so much. I know we have more questions in the chat that we won't have time to get to, but I want to just highlight our, our next year webinar quickly. Um, it's just coming up next Wednesday, July 12th on emerging technologies and infrastructure for monitoring bats and birds offshore. So this webinar, of course, primarily focused on autonomous technologies underwater and gliders, et cetera. Um, so we'll be shifting above water for our next webinar. So thank you again so much for everyone joining. And the link um, for the webinar recording is now in the chat. We'll make sure all of the slides are up available as well. And until next time, thank you.